the founder of the Seljuk dynasty, was an Oghus Turkic warlord with the name Seljuk, hence the name the Seljuk Empire. He, from what is known about him, he served in the Khazar Horde, from which he split and migrated to Khawarizm near the city of Jond, to an area around the Astral Sea, where his horde would later convert to Islam in 985. Later, his descendants would conquer more and more land and migrate down into the Middle East, eventually creating an empire that conquered large amounts of the Middle East in the Middle Ages, but that would also rather quickly fragment into smaller political entities again. This video will be about some of the effects this conquest and empire had on the Middle East and its history. Effect number one. The Seljuks, through their invasion of the Middle East and expansion, caused great devastation and upheaval of previous systems. As the rise of the Seljuks was a great nomadic migration, and as usual with great pastoral nomadic migrations, the invasions usually lead to a lot of plunder, destruction, mass killings and the like, much like the later Mongols, though maybe not as devastating. The Seljuks still destroyed a lot of the Middle East with their conquests. Though not all was simple destruction, as you will see with effect number two. The Seljuks, after their invasion, were responsible in a large part for the revival of both Persian culture and of the Persian language. Despite being a Turkic group, they adopted Persian as their court language, and despite the fact that the Buwayhids, a presumably Persian dynasty, had ruled much of the Middle East just before the Seljuks took over, they hadn't been strong supporters of Persianate culture in the same way as the Seljuks would become, and the Seljuks' adoption and adaption of Persian culture would mean also that Persian culture once again would spread outside of the Iranian heartland, as Persian culture before had been more or less confined to the Iranian heartlands. So the Seljuks' adoption of Persian culture, Persian art, Persian poetry, Persian language and conquest of the Middle East meant that Persian culture, not since the times before Islam, once again was spread back outside of the Iranian heartland into the greater Middle East as Persian literature poetry and arts were promoted by the Seljuks. Though more than just Iranian Persian culture was spread though, as we see in effect number 3. The Seljuks took control of much of the local land that they had conquered and distributed it to various allies and local powerful men, which led to a greater sort of feudalization of the Middle East. And this was a spread of the Persian Dikhkan system, with powerful landlords that directly owned the land through their families. And this system began to replace or coincide together with the powerful Altaf systems of previous land control that had existed before, where the land was held in common and controlled by mosque leaders and mosque congregations as communally owned land. So, with the Seljuks you see a larger movement through this Persian system of less institutionalization of land ownership in favor of more private familial ownership, where you go from mosques owning land to private families owning land. And the introduction of this system sets up the basis for a lot of later conflicts regarding land rights in the region of Syria and Mesopotamia. Speak about various systems and in particular systems of religion with effect number four. The Seljuks were responsible for the Sunni revival, the return of Sunni Islam as a dominant form of Islam in the Middle East. And the Seljuk Turks conquered Baghdad from the Shia Twelver Bawahids in 1055 with the pretext of saving the Abbasid Sunni Caliph al qaim from being overthrown by the Twelver Shia Bawahids. But despite this fact that the Seljuks reintroduced Sunni Islam as a dominant form of Islam in the Middle East, they were actually quite religiously and ethnically tolerant by the standards of their time. As long as tribute was paid, the Seljuks in most cases would be very tolerant of divergent groups. 
do exceptions did exist, as history usually is more complex than just one or the other extreme. For example, the Seljuks barring of Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land and their persecution of Christians was one of the causes that later was used as a pretext for the Crusades by the Christians to the Holy Land. A further elaboration on these series of events is that this was also caused by a singular person, by Aziz ibn Uwak al khawarizmi who established a smaller Seljuk vassal state in Palestine and southern Syria after conquering these areas from the Fatimid Caliphate in 1071 and due to his personal decision to oppress and bar Christian pilgrims from doing pilgrimage to Jerusalem. This was an exception to the general rule of tolerance and openness done by the Seljuks as the Seljuks generally had to be tolerant, as due to the size and contacts with so many cultures and religious groups, such as the Persians, Arabs and Greek-speaking Christian Byzantines and various other sorts of minorities, meant that they had to be open to various cultures and religions. And they were also very open for Byzantine Christian influences, generally, as they were in close contact with the Byzantines. And, and this close contact with the ancient Greco-Roman and Christian traditions only resulted in their adoption of a policy of tolerance toward art, aesthetic life, painting, music, independent thought, in short, toward those things that were frowned upon by the narrow and piously ascetic views of their subjects. The Seljuks were not intolerant extremists, but rather promoted a sort of tolerant Sunni Islam, and it was even tolerant enough to allow Shia Islamic communities to exist within the realm of the Seljuks and even spread in certain areas. Though they did still promote a sort of Sunni Islam, and this is especially what is going to be discussed next, in effect number 5, which is Maturidi Islam. Maturidi theology got introduced into the Middle East as a major theological branch of Sunni Islam by the Seljuks after their conquest of the Middle East and as a part of the Sunni revival that would change Sunni Islam's historic trajectory for a long time. The theology of Maturidi developed in the 9th to 10th centuries, but previously before the Seljuks. It had previously been limited to the areas of Central Asia, but through the Seljuks now it got in introduced into the mainstream religious currents of Sunni Islam, being a main competitor to both Ash'ari theology and Athari theology within Sunni Islam, and eventually Third on making Maturidi Islam the dominant form of theology within Sunni Islam, but also setting up the scene for intersectarian conflicts between Maturidi Sunnis and the Ashari Sunni Muslims, who had previously been a dominant theological strain of Sunni Islam in the area of the Middle East. Unlike previous conflicts regarding precedents of various schools of jurisprudence and of Islamic law that had mostly been civil, with some exceptions, these conflicts would prove more enduring and continue into the later age of the Ottoman Empire, where they would get very bloody. And speaking about the Ottoman Empire, in effect number 6, the migrations of Ughus Turkic people that had happened during the Seljuk Empire's invasions, do not the first migration of Turkic people, was undoubtedly the biggest that had ever occurred and would leave large amounts of Turkic speaking peoples around the northern parts of the Middle East, either through migration or Turkification of the locals there. These people were the peoples that would form the base for several later Turkic dynasties and political entities after the fall of the Seljuk Empire. For example, the Ottoman Empire through the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, and even later the Shia Safavid dynasty, which came from Turkicized Iranian origins and which was supported by Azerbaijani Kisilbash Shia Twelver Ugus Turks. And speaking about the rise of various political entities, maybe it should be better to discuss the fall of political entities, more specifically the fall of the Roman Empire, as in effect number 7. The Seljuks permanently crippled the Roman Empire following the Battle of Manzika in the 26th of August 1071, where the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, 
lost a lot of territory. Its territory was reduced to just a whimper of its original territory. And the natural choke points and natural defenses that had existed in the mountains of the Anatolian Peninsula were lost forever due to this defeat at the hands of the Seljuks. And this weakened position of the Romans would be followed by centuries of hostile conflicts with various Turkic entities descended from the Seljuks, such as the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome and the later Ottomans, who ultimately would spell the doom of the Eastern Roman Empire. So the Seljuks were indirectly the cause of the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, the permanent fall of the Eastern Roman Empire. Do the Seljuks were not only the end of the Romans, but also as we will see with effect number 8. The Seljuks marked the end of powerful Arabic dynasties by ethnic Arabs, though Arabic would still remain in certain places used as a court language. The Seljuks, with their wars against the Fatimids, weakened the Fatimids so much with their invasions of their territories that the Fatimids eventually, due to the Seljuk invasions and internal issues, would collapse and be taken over by the Kurdish Ayyubid dynasty under Salahuddin or as you know him Saladin, which would mean the end of Arabic rule in Egypt and powerful Arabic rule elsewhere in the Middle East until modern times. And speaking about the end of things, the end of the Seljuk Sultanate was due to a process of fragmentation of the Seljuk Empire breaking into smaller parts, smaller political entities as the decentralized rulership of the Seljuk Empire allowed local leaders to take local control over various areas of the empire. Which leads to effect number 9. The Seljuks breaking down would lead to extreme warlordism as various smaller entities would dominate the Middle East for a long time as the Seljuk Empire began to break down into smaller entities with various minor powers vying for control and dominance over their neighbors with powers such as the Burid and Sengid dynasties in Syria, the Artukid dynasty in the north of modern day Iraq, the Anushtekin dynasty in Central Asia and the Danishmets in Anatolia, just to name a few. There were a lot more. Seriously, the Middle East was beginning to look similar to Europe at this time, which was a chaotic mess of smaller entities constantly fighting against each other. This sort of chaos and constant infighting between smaller entities would also ease later conquest by the Mongols. And one of these successor states of the Seljuks, one of these breakout states, the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum in Anatolia, would later give rise to the Ottomans that would become the Ottoman Empire. So this chaos and this state of fractured smaller states would become the background for other later greater empires to arise from the collapse of the Seljuks. And as the fighting between these lesser political entities would lead to a power vacuum in the early periods following the collapse of the Seljuk Empire. Which leads to the next point which is effect number 10. The Crusaders and the Mongols appear in the vacuum of power that occurred with the collapse of the Seljuks. As most of these smaller entities that were a result of the collapsing nature of the Seljuk Empire were busy fighting each other and or maintaining their own control of their borders to actually confront the Crusaders and later Mongols. The Crusaders, unlike the Mongols, were actually pretty weak. However, the other entities of the Middle East were so divided and too focused upon fighting each other which prevented them from acting against the crusaders, an issue that would continue even to the time of the Mongolic invasions. And it would be the Ayyubid dynasty in Egypt and finally the Mamluks of Egypt that stopped and finally finished the crusaders and not the direct successors of the Seljuks as they would become absorbed by the Mongolic hordes that descended upon the Middle East and took control of most of the Middle East under the ill Khanate until they were eventually stopped by the Mamluks too. And these were 10 important effects on the history of the Middle East as caused by the rise and fall of the Seljuk Empire. Please ask questions, comment and give a like to this video. Please do subscribe as it would help the channel spread awareness about the humanities. Stärk upp eller kan att vi med folk.